Good afternoon and happy Earth Day. We are currently launching the live stream and will be ready to start momentarily. Thank you for joining the Building a Green Road to Recovery Earth Day webinar with Congresswoman Suzanne Bonamici, Chair of the Select Committee on the Climate Crisis, Congresswoman Kathy Castor, and Environment and Labor Leaders. We are currently launching the live stream and will be ready to start momentarily. Thank you for joining the Building a Green Road to Recovery Earth Day webinar with Congresswoman Suzanne Bonamici, Chair of the Select Committee on the Climate Crisis, Congresswoman Kathy Castor, and Environment and Labor Leaders. We will begin the Building a Green Road to Recovery discussion now. Thank you everyone for joining us. I'm Suzanne Bonamici and I'm honored to represent Northwest Oregon in the US Congress. And thank you for joining me and all of us to recognize the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. Now, right now we're facing an unprecedented health and economic crisis. And I wanna first acknowledge that these are very challenging times for everyone. Many of us are worried about loved ones who are sick or vulnerable. And we know that nearly 22 million people have filed for unemployment benefits just in the last month across this country. The pandemic has upended livelihoods and prevented significant health challenges for our families, our neighbors, and our communities. And I'm very grateful for all the workers on the front line right now, our healthcare workers, our first responders, childcare providers, grocery workers, postal and delivery workers. They're keeping our communities going. And I know, uh, Chair Castor and I were fighting to make sure that these workers have access to the workplace protections and the essential pay that they have earned. And one of my top priorities at this time is making sure that Congress provides the necessary assistance for workers, for small businesses and communities that are truly struggling during this pandemic. Tomorrow, the House is expected to pass a bill to strengthen support for the Small Business Paycheck Protection Program and help hospitals and frontline workers access more personal protective equipment and importantly, rapidly scale up our, our testing capabilities. This will provide this desperately needed resources to our communities, but we already know it's not enough. We're working on another bill to provide more support to workers and our local and state governments. I've advocated for increased funding uh, for childcare in this next relief package. I've led my colleagues in calling for additional assistance programs to help low-income families pay for utility and water bills. And I've championed efforts to advocate for workforce development programs to help reduce layoffs and provide reskilling and upskilling opportunities for displaced or dislocated workers. But eventually, Congress will face uh, and focus on a long-term recovery package. And Speaker Pelosi has suggested, and many of us are advocating, that it will have an infrastructure focus. The center of a recovery package must focus on creating and restoring good paying jobs. And with this, we have the opportunity to incorporate uh, climate resilient infrastructure in that process. I am so honored to serve on the House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis. I'm the only uh, member uh, on the committee from the Pacific Northwest. And I'm also a senior member of the Education and Labor Committee. And in recognition of the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, I'm so pleased to be joined by this panel of labor, labor and environment stakeholders to discuss building a green road to recovery that strengthens energy efficiency, expands access to transit, supports a transition to natural infrastructure and creates good paying jobs. And I'm excited, very excited to be joined by my colleague from Florida and chair of the Select Committee on the Climate Crisis, Kathy Castor, for today's discussion. Chair Castor has been an environmental champion and leader in the House for 14 years. I am proud to serve with her and with her leadership on the committee. And I've seen firsthand her commitment to a clean energy economy. And with that, I'll turn it over to Chair Castor to provide some opening remarks. Chair Castor, are you with us? Hi, hi, uh, happy Earth Day, everyone. Uh, Rep Bonamici, thank you very much for including me today. Uh, Boy, and I want to let me start by saying thank you to everyone for doing your part to stay safe during the COVID pandemic. It really is 
is an extraordinary time. Lessons uh, to be learned here is in prayers for all of the frontline workers from my colleague, Rep. Bonamici. We are so fortunate to have uh, Suzanne Clark on this committee, and we have spent the last year crafting uh, recommendations for carbon pollution and build a more resilient uh, America with an eye to environmental justice and lifting up communities that are on the front lines of the other ongoing crisis, the climate crisis. We were poised in March to release our, uh, our very detailed report after our year of work and hearings and hearing from a lot of experts and and um, compiling a lot of input. So we have some strong recommendations already on public health and resiliency, how we have to uh, be mindful of the communities that are disproportionately impacted by COVID and by climate change. For example, just last week, we held a committee briefing with the university public health experts who have already identified the fact that if you live in a community that is impacted by air pollution, you're more likely to die be, due to COVID. So we've, there is a, a, a match here uh, when it comes to public health and when it comes to addressing the climate uh, as an ongoing crisis and tackling this pandemic. Uh, Rep. Bron Amici brings a lot of skill and knowledge from her service as a senior member on the Education and Labor Committee about how we work on those communities in transition, how we empower workers. She also brings this great expertise on ocean policy, really is the go-to leader in the United States Congress when it comes to uh, making sure our oceans are healthy and well. We are also in the week of the BP uh, Deepwater Horizon that impacted my state. Uh, but she also understands how we have to harness the oceans as a power source, a clean power source for the future as we transition to a clean energy economy. So thanks for including me today and I look forward to the discussion. Well, thank you so much, Chair Caster. And now um, I'd like our panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, let's start with Meredith from Climate Solutions. Hi, yes, um, my name is Meredith Connolly. I'm the Oregon Director of Climate Solutions, and Climate Solutions is a nonprofit accelerating uh, the Pacific Northwest transition to a clean energy, low carbon economy. We work on clean energy and climate policies and programs here in Oregon. Terrific. Thank you, Meredith. And Evelyn's with us from the Pacific Northwest Regional Council of Carpenters. Evelyn. Hello, thank you for so much for having me today. I'm Evelyn Shapiro. I am the elected leader of a six state region of the Carpenters Union, the Pacific Northwest Regional Council. Uh, we span from Alaska down to Oregon to Wyoming and represent 29,000 hardworking men and women in the construction industry. I'm very passionate about this issue and figuring out how we can work together to come up with uh, strong solutions for the environment and labor. Thank you so much, Evelyn. Um, and next, uh, Jana's here from the Oregon Environmental Council. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jana Gastelum, Deputy Director for Programs at Oregon Environmental Council. We, our organization is just a little bit older than Earth Day. We've been around for 50 plus years and really working on multi-issues to protect land, air, and create toxic-free environments. Um, and we, I've been really honored to be also be able to co-chair the Oregon Blue Green Alliance for the last couple of years and have greatly appreciated our partnerships with labor leaders as well. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Jana. And Robert's here with the Oregon Building Trades. Robert. Hello, Congresswoman Bonamici, Chair Caster. Thank you for allowing me to represent the organization that I'm uh, the exec executive secretary for the Oregon State Building Construction Trades Council. We're an umbrella organization with uh, over 30 building trades unions. We represent tens of thousands of uh, skilled trades, women and men working throughout the state of Oregon. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you, Robert. Nav is here with the Nature Conservancy. Welcome, Nav. Thank you, Congresswoman. Um, thank you for this opportunity and good to be with you, Chair Castor. 
um, and to all of you colleagues. Uh, I am uh, Nav Dayanand with the Nature Conservancy, where I serve as a senior policy advisor. The Nature Conservancy is a global conservation organization uh, operating in 79 countries and all 50 states uh, in the United States. And uh, our focus is on protecting land and water upon which all life depends. And uh, I look forward to participating today with you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Kelly is here with Oregon Tradeswomen. Hi, Kelly, welcome. Hello, thank you so much for this opportunity to serve on the panel today, Congresswoman Bonamici. Appreciate your efforts in bringing us all together to celebrate Earth Day. Um, I'm Kelly Kupchak. I'm the Executive Director of Oregon Tradeswomen. Our organization is a small uh, nonprofit headquartered in Portland, Oregon, and we serve women with a focus on low-income women and women of color to help support them with training and support services, job placement, retention and leadership development to help them get into high road jobs in union construction career pathways. And we're excited to be on the panel today. Glad you're here. And last but certainly not least, Jessica from the Blue Green Alliance. Thank you, Congresswoman, and thank you, Chair Castor. Thank you both for your for your leadership and the opportunity to be here today. Hi, everyone. I'm Jessica Ektish. I'm the Legislative Director at the Blue Green Alliance. I am based in Washington, D.C., but as you heard from, from Jana, we do have uh, an active Oregon state table. We are a, a national partnership of 13 labor unions and environmental organizations. We were founded nearly 15 years ago uh, on the idea that no one should have to choose between a good job and a clean environment. We, we can and we must have both of those. So we work to bring our partners together to solve today's environmental challenges in ways that are good for working people. And I'm excited to be with you all here today. Thank you. Terrific, what a great panel. Thanks everybody. Uh, a note to our audience, this event will be live streamed on my YouTube channel. We accepted questions in advance from participants and will not take live questions during today's discussion. But if you have any questions during the event, please use the chat feature. And I'm gonna start with Chair Castor. Uh, Chair Castor, you were in the house in 2009 when Congress passed the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, ARA, which included the single largest investment in clean energy in our nation's history. So what are the most important lessons learned about how to earn bipartisan support for clean energy provisions in an economic recovery package. And then to all of our panelists, um, after Chair Castor, what worked well or didn't work well in the Recovery Act for climate resilient investments in Oregon? Chair Castor. Yeah, you've this, unfortunately, uh, the economic fallout already from the, the COVID pandemic is reminding me of of the dark days after the economic collapse in 2008. And then it was, we had a series of bills then too, but the crowning achievement was the uh, Recovery Act that uh, was intended to create thousands and thousands of jobs through, uh, through infrastructure projects, uh, many of them. So on the clean energy front, there really at that time, there wasn't a lot of uh, disagreement on investing in some clean energy uh, projects through the Department of Energy and uh, and uh, kind of those innovative new technologies. Uh, we were able also to invest in transit systems. Uh, I think, unfortunately, the Congress is is fairly divided today when it comes to fossil fuels and decarbonization, but. As you've seen, uh, Rep. Bonamici on the Climate Committee, we have uh, found bipartisan ground when it comes to agriculture and our food systems, how we decarbonize the industrial sector, uh, they're uh, on building resilience into communities with uh, using natural systems along our coastlines and uh, riverine systems and using wetlands to restore and protect the coast. Uh, rather than allowing bulkheads to be built. So there is bipartisan ground and uh, the, the difficulty will be, it will come at us very quickly as they move to, to craft uh, a recovery plan. But fortunately, uh, Chairman Peter DeFazio has a fantastic clean and green bill already in transportation and infrastructure. 
uh, in the Energy and Commerce Committee where I serve their Lift America Act that uh, proposes to rebuild the grid across the country. Uh, there's, that's fairly bipartisan already, so I'm hopeful. Good, I, I, I'm hopeful as well. Panelists, any thoughts on what worked well or didn't work well in the Recovery Act um, for climate resilient investments in Oregon? Kelly? So I mean, mm -hmm. Kelly with Oregon Tradeswomen. I think one of the pieces that we can look to that was very successful, even though it was a, a small portion of the previous recovery bill was the Home Weatherization Assistance Program. Many, many jobs were created and also supported families living in low income and low income housing, low income families. Uh, over 800,000 homes were weatherized, providing savings and energy efficiencies to our nation's most vulnerable families. And it also created uh, many jobs as well as reinvestment back into the community. So when you look at the return on investment, I think that's also important to look at this from an economic standpoint. And um, it's certainly uh, those that job creation was aligned with um, our environmental community. And so I, I think that's definitely a piece we can look to as a success. Terrific. Anybody else have any thoughts on that? Well, that, that's- Congressman bon Bonamici? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, one of the things that, well, what worked well for us in the trades was that it was a significant infusion of, of dollars at, at a time when the construction industry was just devastated by high rates of, of unemployment that would be almost unfathomable in other industries. Uh, some of our local unions were experiencing as high as 50% unemployment. So I think about one in every two people were out of work uh, and with no way to put food on the table. So. Um, that seemed to have worked well for us, uh, or one of the things that we thought worked well. One of the things that didn't work so well was uh, not all those projects that were used uh, were used what, in a way that we call with high high road standards, uh, like the ones. I mean, it, it's it's so important that we have you know uh, strong labor standards in any of those investments, um, so that we don't see that happen again uh, in this recovery is uh, it invited a lot of unscrupulous contractors to the table to kind of feed off it and um, exploit workers and take advantage of them. So we just want to make sure that uh, any, any other investment that comes out has those uh, utilization requirements to continue to uh, help us create opportunities uh, for women and underrepresented uh, communities so that we can continue our commitment to uh, diversity and inclusion. So um, that's it's really important to us. So, Terrific, thank you. Thank, you. The, the, thank you, Robert. Those are all great points. And I know it's something that we will be uh, focusing on as we move forward. Um, and, you, and you mentioned how many people were, were out of work then. Um, nearly 22 million people have filed for unemployment in the last month. And the center of a recovery package will have to focus on uh, restoring or creating good paying jobs. So what does this economic transition need to include for workers? And importantly, how can Congress better support individuals who have historically uh, faced barriers to employment, uh, especially women and people of color? How can we help them access and thrive as we're, we're building this um, new, new blue green economy? When it, I'd like to respond, uh, Representative Bonamici. Uh, so in the construction trades, we have a tremendous opportunity in particular to provide uh, well-paid jobs for uh, a number of people. And uh, in that vein, we do a tremendous amount of efforts in recruitment and training and retention for women and people of color. Uh, currently, our numbers do not reflect at all where our goals need to be. And uh, we need to hold up our end of the bargain to do hard work to bring communities in to do that work. Uh, but we also need strong standards in the green jobs task forces so that our members do have strong access to those, those jobs. One of the big problems historically is that uh, various industries get displaced and then they get replaced with lower wage work and uh, lower requirements and lower standards. Where the unions can really help and the labor community can really help is being strong partners in uh, shoring up training opportunities, designing training, and uh, you know, at the very base of it, we know how to do the work, we're skilled and we're ready to go and we'll get, we'll get in there and do the work for you. Terrific, thank you so much, Evelyn. Um, and I know that that is, 
the focus, yes? Oh, I just would yeah. like to add that I think from the past stimulus, there were some lessons learned as well and, and going forward that as we look at new job creation opportunities um, to have a holistic look, because I think there were some cases where um, there were dollars available maybe for efficiency majors, but not for basic home or roof repair. And so it's hard to really get a whole job done if you don't have funding streams in a couple of different places that really make the project work. And so I hope that there's a really holistic look at how we can actually make projects move forward by making sure that we're addressing all a variety of issues that are on the ground. Um, and I think there's a lot of opportunity and there were a lot of great examples of how that worked well. But particularly for lower income households, I think we're gonna need a variety of different types of programs to really make these projects come together. Thank you, Jana. And I know in our- pick um, up. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Kelly. Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt. I was just going to say, you know, along with what Jana and Evelyn have already mentioned, when we look at uh, job training programs or retraining programs, especially when we're talking about our most vulnerable job seekers, it's really important to couple that training with supportive services. We serve uh, approximately 73% of the women we serve in our program, for example, are very low income or have no income at all. And so ensuring that they can actually get to training or if they're doing remote training, have access to the internet, a laptop, um, have stipends while they're in training. Those are things that are really important to consider as well. So we can get folks not just back to jobs, but to careers. Absolutely, and that's the conversation that we're having, for example, about registered apprenticeships and making sure that those support services are there. And one of the things that I wanna mention is that we have really seen, uh, both with the climate crisis, and we've talked about this a lot in the select committee, how it's disproportionately affected um, particular communities, communities of color, low income communities. And we're seeing that analogous situation with, with the coronavirus pandemic. So I think it just emphasizes the need to approach this with uh, an equity lens uh, as we are, are moving forward. Um, I, I know I, I have several more questions, so I'm gonna to, to move on. You know, as people are complying with governor's orders, some across the country, but we are in Oregon, um, they're likely consuming more electricity in their household than they did prior to the start of the pandemic. So one of our, um, uh, piece, one piece of our recovery really must be to make sure that more individuals can access support services to help pay their energy and water bills. Can we seize on this opportunity to improve energy efficiency in our homes and communities? And we, we touched on that briefly, but what are the important steps that can be taken to reduce building emissions? And we've had uh, many conversations about that in the, in the select committee and as an Oregonian, I'm always talking about cross-laminated timber and, and other things that we can do that both help the, the planet and the, the, the local economies. But uh, for the panelists, how can we really seize on this to improve energy efficiency, but also how can we really address the building emissions uh, issues and create jobs in this sector? I'll maybe jump in on this one. This is Jessica with, with Blue Green Alliance. Um, first, just want to to second your call for making sure that folks can access support services. That's something we're we're calling for and really focus on in terms of the immediate crisis. Um, in terms of looking forward, and I think this ties back to the the lessons learned from the Recovery Act. Uh, we see a tremendous opportunity here, both for both in terms of climate emissions reductions, public health impacts, and and job creation. Uh, there are over 2 million jobs in energy efficiency right now, and a lot of these, and our uh, fellow panelists in the, in the building and construction trades can speak to this well, that a lot of these are, are good paying union jobs in the building trades. Um, there's also a, a manufacturing component here. Um, there are around 280,000 workers manufacturing uh, energy efficient products in the U.S. right now. So I think one of the, the ways that the Recovery Act uh, was really helpful here was through, someone already mentioned the, the weatherization assistance program. And I think the key thing for us is making sure that we are not only investing in these programs that would incentivize energy efficiency retrofits, but really tying them to concrete labor standards, prevailing wage requirements, domestic content requirements. And, and to the, the earlier point, you know, things like local higher provisions, other procurement policies that can benefit low-income communities, people of color, color women-owned businesses. So really uh, making sure that how we make the investment uh, delivers to communities and, and workers as well. Absolutely, and that, um, did anybody else want to weigh in to that? 
uh, on that particular issue. It, it really leads to the, the next um, question I wanted to bring up, and that's talking about the way that we do our transition to a clean energy economy and support workers is, is really critical. And these are very important conversations to be having now because there are so many people who are out of work. We're gonna want and need them to get back to work as soon as possible. But historically, many of those federal clean energy investments have failed to uphold labor standards as we've heard um, and by American standards and Davis-Bacon and prevailing wage and all, the use of community benefit agreement and project labor agreements. And I think we're seeing, I just had a conversation with some people before this call about how, you know, in terms of buy America, we've seen the problems of having goods manufactured that we need manufactured overseas. So can you talk about how we can reevaluate these programs to better support the needs of workers as we are uh, ramping up uh, in the next package, we hope uh, a, a major investment to get people back to work. Uh, Representative Bonamici, I'm happy to take that question. Uh, as you know, you had mentioned cross-laminated timber recently, and as you know, we were uh, definitely early adopters of that uh, building type. And uh, we're actually partnering with a cross-laminated timber manufacturer that we hope to uh, be, be making some really good progress with very soon. So when it comes to either using materials, whether it comes to uh, doors that I personally have installed in my career 15 years ago that were made out of wheat, you know, wheat that you make bread with, uh, or, or any kind of other kind of material, the technology is absolutely there. And we have both skilled craftspeople who can do the work, and we have the ability and the means to bring people into that work. Uh, so I think when it comes to, you know, the training transitions for bringing in a workforce that's ready and able to respond, uh, that's absolutely in place and ready to go. Uh, but you're absolutely right when it comes to the standards, you had mentioned apprenticeship standards earlier. Uh, there's also a tremendous amount of standards that can be put in place to support other populations, uh, whether it's uh, women, whether it's people of color, whether it's residents who are living in the area of the project mm -hmm. uh, or in lower income brackets. Uh, tribal lands, there's a tremendous amount of opportunity and uh, it's a fairly easy process when it comes to putting those standards in place. It's not an easy process to get them adopted as I'm sure you know, but uh, uh, there's there's a just a tremendous opportunity there. Absolutely, absolutely there is, thank you. Uh, one of the uh, examples that I've seen. Yeah, now I'm I'm um, uh, This, um, is a tremendous opportunity at this time for the Congress. Um, as, as you know very well, Congresswoman, the last time a recovery package like this was enacted in 2009, over $100 billion was invested in clean energy and energy efficiency and natural resources jobs. Um, the case that we're trying to make in order to make sure there's equity um, with all of the interests that you're um, surfacing today in this conversation is um, to fully utilize federal programs that, that do enable people to get back to work. For example, through the Corporation for National and Community Service, nearly 75,000 AmeriCorps members are currently serving in communities across the country, contributing to energy efficiency, coastal conservation, disaster resilience, forest management and other such activities. And, and there are these job core and coastal conservation core and veteran conservation core uh, programs that could be sort of a starting place where natural resource interests and um, job creating and job support interests align. Um, and certainly the kind of caution that other panelists are uh, you know, sharing with you today are those that need to be taken into consideration. And um, we certainly um, are making the case that um, the conservation of the environment um, and our um, lands and water shouldn't be an optional amenity, but really the cornerstone of thriving economies. So if people agree um, with that premise, um, then um, we would love to be able to lend some of our expertise in coming together and providing the Congress with recommendations of key programs, 
where all of those equity issues that are of top concern to members, as well as these conservation programs are well invested in. Congressman Thank or you, Congresswoman Senator. Bonamici. And yes, Robert, go ahead. Thank you. Right, Thank could you. I add, yes, I'd like to add to that. Uh, so I think my answer uh, is sort of embedded into the question. Uh, so I would simply agree and suggest that at the time of environmental laws being passed separate from labor standards, is, is hopefully become a thing of the past. Um, it's my understanding that in the past, we would have one session focused on low carbon fuels, but, and nothing to do with transportation investment. So um, the next session would be focused on transportation with nothing to help move the ball on environmental laws. And that back and forth has fostered division between the building trades and the environmental community who are both clearly parts of the democratic base. Uh, so we showed in the last session with the cap and trade that we can work together. And I hope that's the new approach that we, we follow going forward. Um, and we find ways to move both at the same time. So thank you. I hope so too. I'm gonna ask Chair Castor to weigh in on that thought as well. Chair Castor, well, all of the points that you all, I'm there, got me? Okay, uh, all the points that you all have raised uh, are being discussed right now in the Congress. Uh, definitely among the, the Democratic caucus, we've got to broaden the discussion uh, to a lot of our GOP colleagues. I think this is an unprecedented time and we're all gonna be focused on how, how we uh, provide an emergency response right now and a thoughtful uh, stimulus eventually that is the job creation piece. Piece. And it always seems like when you're in a rush and, are, and you're in a hurry, people say, well, we can compromise on the labor standards on Davis-Bacon and prevailing wage, but no, we can't. We, we've learned that when you do that, you set our country farther back when you don't create family sustaining jobs that are meaningful, that provide health benefits, uh, that you're, it's not a real economic recovery. We have inequality right now and that we help repair it. We've learned this in the past. We do. The, and, it, and this is really going to take all of us working together um, in, in Congress with, with our colleagues across the aisle, but with all of you as well. You know, I, I know that uh, we we're fortunate to have Chairman DeFazio, an Oregonian, and I know that uh, uh, he's leading on the comprehensive infrastructure package, and we know it needs to go beyond roads and bridges. The transportation sector uh, continues to represent the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in the United States. And we have seen, uh, if you look across um, the, the country now, the people driving less and factories shut down, and uh, we, we're seeing cleaner air. Um, so when, when we, when we make the transition, I think we need to learn from that and say, how can, how can we strengthen those federal investments, number one, in public transit and electric vehicle infrastructure so we can support our region's um, economic vitalization and reduce emissions at the same time? And what should be included in our, our definition of infrastructure? Who wants to yeah. start? In fact, I'll Here. jump in if that's all right. This is an issue near and dear to my heart. Transportation is the largest source of climate pollution in Oregon, um, as well as the country. And there are many things we need to move the sector um, and, and get us in a better position there. And, and I'm glad to hear that you're lifting up both transit and electrification. It, there are many solutions here. Um, on the EV infrastructure side, I do hope, um, I think that is a shift to think about EV infrastructure um, as part of that definition and how do we electrify the state. Here in Oregon, we've struggled to even find sustainable funding for our West Coast Electric Highway and having that kind of a network that can connect major corridors and allow people to even get across the state and up and down I-5 and these other major corridors in electric vehicles. I think in really building out that network, doing an equity analysis of where the gaps are, where do we need to build out to create that reliability is really important. A lot of small towns here see it as an economic opportunity. They're starting to put EV chargers in small towns so that people pull off the road, stop there, charge up, walk around town. So there are many layers to the economic opportunities presented there too. Um, and I, I think on also looking at electrification beyond just cars, 
a big piece of it with public transit is electrifying our transit system. Here in Oregon, TriMet, the bus system that serves the Portland metro area is the biggest consumer of diesel in the state. And getting off of diesel, going to electric buses presents many good opportunities for uh, building out bus depots that are all electric here in Oregon, uh, getting those actual buses on the road, and then also making sure that um, a lot of the manufacturers are starting to be uh, union, provide union jobs, make them here in America. So there's, there are many opportunities in, in that push as well that I, I think we should be really focusing on here. Yeah, absolutely, Meredith. And I know TriMet has some electric buses, but not nearly enough. And as a country, we are way behind um, in, in that area. And as we are looking at economic recovery, that is definitely something we've had these conversations in the select committee as well about the, the issues with the transportation sector. And, and I know that um, Oregon is perhaps ahead of other states in terms of charging infrastructure, but it's still not enough. Another equity issue that's brought to our attention is that people who live in apartments are less likely to be able to number one, afford an electric vehicle, and number, number two, have, they have a barrier of where do I plug it in at night? I don't have a garage. So as we we're looking at that uh, charging stations and, and a charging uh, infrastructure as part of infrastructure, it's gonna be uh, critical to that, uh, that effort. Uh, Congresswoman Bonamici, uh, not not to be the broken record, but uh, we need investments with strong labor standards. It's 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 really it's a really simple formula, straightforward, and it's easy to understand. It just takes some grit from our legislative and congressional leaders to to stand up to these businesses uh, that would rather uh, see themselves. Uh, I mean, just profiting off of workers. So I mean, it's that's really what we need. I appreciate that, Robert. And I know Jana wants to add um, something as well. Yeah, I do think transportation is a big issue and it's a big opportunity for all of us collectively. I think it hits on health um, resiliency because of the pollutants that can come into the air. Um, it relates to economic resiliency because transportation connects us to our jobs and opportunities. Um, and it matters a lot for climate resiliency as well. So what's the system we put in place? And I think I'm really glad that there's a conversation about transit. Um, you know, the transit systems were just starting to recover from the last recession in terms of jobs and service levels. And so we really need to make sure that we're continuing to invest in those systems. Um, in Oregon, there's 20 to 25% of our population that can't drive, whether it's because of age, you're old or you're young, um, abilities or economics. And so transportation, making sure it meets everyone's needs is really critical. Um, doing it in as clean a way as possible is important. And then I think right now, how we allocate space and scarce public dollars will be really important. We're learning from this COVID uh, crisis that, you know, having places to bike and walk and have that an option to be able to connect to things is really important. And we don't have, we dedicate a whole lot of space to motorized vehicles and not as much space to helping people get away around in other healthier ways as well. And so um, as we go forward and we know public dollars are stretched, um, I think it's also important that we do, we have wise use of them. So maintaining the system that we have will be a lot more cost effective and trying to figure out how to use it as efficiently as possible. Um, and I think this crisis has certainly shown um, exactly where our inequities are. And so we need to have a strong focus on serving the people who really need it the most moving forward as well. Thank you so much, Jana. Absolutely. I'm glad you brought up the sort of trail and park infrastructure is so important from a healthcare perspective as well. Um, people right now with the challenges that, you know, I've talked to people who are just devastated, but you know, it makes them feel better is to go outside and to walk on a trail and, and to, to be able to breathe fresh air. Um, and, and so it, that, that's a, a really important part. Um, and I, I, I know, Chair Kester, did you want to add something? I couldn't tell if you were getting ready to speak. Okay, I, I'm going to move on. Um, Boy, I, Brett Bonamici. Go ahead, Chair. Kathy? Uh, yes, can you hear me okay? Yes, now I can. How about now? Uh, 
all the folks in Oregon, you all are going to love our climate action plan because we touch on all the topics that you raised and think even bigger scale uh, when it comes to the transportation sector into cleaning up maritime, into cleaning up aviation, you know, all of the on airport at the port operations, they can decarbonize quickly. The fleets uh, for government vehicles, uh, postal service and others that are delivering all these packages and delivering your groceries right now, decarbonizing, electrifying them uh, and school buses. What a wonderful thing it will be where every child that rides a school bus uh, to school, they're doing it in a clean electric bus. But what has to go along with that is cleaning up the grid, uh, decarbonizing the grid, taking us off fossil fuels onto cleaner energy sources. And I think you, we couldn't reflect here on Earth Day without understanding the damage that the Trump administration has done. Even in the midst of a pandemic uh, with a disease that is attacking your lungs, they decide it's fine to roll back environmental protections on the cars with that we drive and uh, the soot coming out of smokestacks. It's, it's, there's, there's a big contrast here and uh, I know you all are aware of it and, and are working to make it a better place. Th thank you so much, Chair Caster. And, and speaking of Oregon, you know, I think about um, how our natural systems, you know, the tidal marshes, wetlands, can really help to address uh, polluted runoff, but also increase infrastructure resilience against sea level rise, uh, which I know you're familiar with as a Floridian, uh, Kathy, but flooding, storm surge, and other extreme weather events, which are becoming more frequent in the climate crisis. So how can Congress better support a transition from traditional sort of gray infrastructure projects to green natural infrastructure? And what are some of the other sort of co-benefits of those investments? Uh, I'm just going to happy to take a stab well, at that. Uh, Sorry, go ahead, Chair Caster. We'll let Chair Caster go in the knob and then I think Evelyn wanted to add something. Chair Caster? Well, I'll tell you, we're a whole lot smarter now. I, yeah, we're, we're a whole lot smarter now. Uh, we, um, you know, I come from a community, the Tampa Bay area that's most vulnerable to, to storm surge. And I had to flee my home and, and board up my house uh, after that monster hurricane Irma came through. And what we've learned over time is a lot of our, our natural systems are the best uh, protections. They're less expensive. Uh, and they, they protect us better. So there's an important co-benefit. So we have to do this. And if there's any bipartisanship when it comes to, to acting on climate, it's the fact that just about every community is suffering hotter temperatures, uh, flooding, uh, and they understand that our natural systems, uh, remember the folks we heard from the leaders of Indian tribes across the country, they understand that, that we have to be smarter with the tax dollar. And there's a lot of science and know-how out there. We just have to put it to work. Absolutely. And I know Nav and, uh, Nav and then Evelyn. Yes, thank you, Congresswoman. You know, one case that we've been trying to make for a while is that, um, we really need um, infrastructure policy to include nature-based solutions so that it supports the robust economic development and quality of life for our communities, um, as well as in, in investing in uh, sort of nature. Um, so we have been advocating for um, these nature-based solutions to be part of the equation for any hard infrastructure um, investments uh, that the Congress would drive. And that you've mentioned uh, Chairman DeFazio's effort on the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. There's a similar effort with the Energy and Commerce Committee. And in each of these areas, we're, we're, we've been advocating for recommendations to ensure the consideration of nature and nature-based solutions. So for example, in the, on the Oregon coast, um, we've been looking at how we could um, do some strategic upgrades of tide gates um, so that we can uh, manage um, sort of fish passage 
and manage sort of the flooding risk to communities while also uh, investing in the type of infrastructure upgrade and, and jobs that these, these uh, coastal communities can benefit from. So that's just one example, um, uh, but there are a number through our public land system and how you know, investments on better design of culverts, uh, better um, you know, management of riparian zones so that roads are not really um, adjacent to, uh, to areas where runoff could, uh, could happen. Uh, so those are just uh, examples of how nature and nature-based solutions can offer some alternatives. And they're good examples. And then Evelyn, you wanted to weigh in on this as well. Yeah, thank you, Representative. You know, I was telling my staff team this morning that our charge really is to uh, create a world and look out for a world that can be here for our children and grandchildren without displacing our parents and our grandparents in the process. And um, that's where a really this really beautiful com uh, conversation and partnership between labor and environment can just make a, a sweet connection. And I think that Jana said it very well, uh, transportation packages are absolutely a win-win for everyone involved. Uh, we love to build light rail and trains, uh, but also onto what Nav referred to, uh, the uh, water dams that produce electricity, the windmills, the fish ladders, uh, everything in between. So. Uh, all of these projects just have a, a tremendous opportunity for everyone involved. Thank you so much. I want to, to move on a little bit to um, healthcare, and I know Chair Castor mentioned this, but we had this bipartisan briefing with researchers about how long-term exposure to particulate matter affects respiratory and cardiovascular health, exacerbates coronavirus symptoms, and can actually increase risk of death, particularly for African-American men. The coronavirus pandemic has also reinforced the emerging health and safety issues for workers, which will not only exist as a result of COVID-19, but may persist as we prepare for increasing temperatures and hazardous smoke um, affects the, how that affects the air quality and other hazardous workplace conditions, particularly uh, for farm workers. Um, so how can we better protect workers and frontline communities as we are moving into this recovery um, uh, and with, with so many jobs at stake, but so many lives at stake. Uh, Representative, I, I'm just gonna jump in with a very, very brief answer on this. Um, you know, PPE is really the answer. I think PPE is something, personal protective equipment is something we've, uh, we talk about daily in construction and always have, and I've been delighted to hear people talking about PPE and understanding that word very much over the last few weeks. Uh, you know, there's been really, really important focus on getting PPE to our frontline grocery, grocery store heroes and our frontline medical heroes who are out on the lines. Uh, we also have you know, a lot of other workforces, construction included and, and other labor forces that are performing essential work and don't have access to that PPE. And that's really tough because we're out there saying, hey, we want you to work safely and in a healthy way. And, uh, and, and we haven't been able to get them the PPE they need. And so uh, really, really doubling down on those efforts so that we can get everyone the protections they need is important. And Kat, so thank you so much, Evelyn, for that, because the, I know Chair Caster, um, like I, have been listening to stories from uh, people in the districts we represent about how that shortage is really creating serious, serious health risks. And, uh, and, and here, here again is another great opportunity for US manufacturing because um, I, I have a assisted living um, facility close to my home and the owner ordered uh, masks and other PPE from Hong Kong because he just couldn't get them here. And then they get stuck coming through customs and in the meantime, people's lives are at stake. And, and so it, it, you're, you're right about the importance of it. And we're, um, we know that you know, so many of our friends in the labor movement have been leaders on safe working conditions. And we, it, it's, again, we're seeing the coronavirus highlighting some of these issues um, and, and the need to protect our, really protect our frontline communities is, is especially true now, but true always for people who are, are doing that work. Uh, Robert. 
Uh, yes, Congressman Woman Bonamici. Uh, you know, there's really no silver bullet here. I think we need to just continue to be persistent and and constantly check in with the workers to find out what the conditions are on the ground and not focus on on talking points uh, put out by the businesses and their branding campaign. I think we need to continue to, to talk to the workers and hear from them and and lift up those employers who are trying to do the right thing and make sure that they know the policies and procedures uh, that need to be in place to help foster a safe working environment. So, right. And, and one, one thing, Congressman, Congress oh. just, sorry, just to, to build on that, um, it's been really discouraging to, to see the way that OSHA has been handling this crisis. And, and one thing that uh, I know you, you both and House leadership have really been advocating for that we are going to continue to push for in, in the next packages that move is, is a requiring an OSHA emergency standard to make sure that workers are protected on the job. And, and just to, to build on, on what you offered, Congresswoman Bonamici, about domestic manufacturing, um, fully agree that this crisis has really cast a spotlight on the dangers of not having a robust domestic supply chain. So as we think about you know, rebuilding and reinvesting, uh, thinking about how we reshore and, and reinvest in domestic manufacturing for the long term, but also as we think about the immediate crisis, um, also making sure that we're really fully utilizing the De Defense Production Act. And Meredith, did you wanna weigh in? I, I wanted to just, uh, because you asked specifically about farm workers too, who aren't represented um, here on the panel, but um, we've had the opportunity to work closely with our incredible farm workers union, Pukun here in Oregon, who has gotten active um, in uh, working on climate policy as well. So I'm, I'm very happy to see that um, farm workers are now acknowledged as essential workers. Um, I, we need to see all worker protections being extended to the, to our farm workers as well, and and not have these immigration or, or other pieces layered onto um, requirements from the federal government for how to access um, benefits. Uh, but also, the, our agricultural economy is very threatened by climate change itself, and our farm workers are exposed in the fields in hot, smoky wildfire. Um, air always out there in the elements. And so they truly are on the front lines. And some of the things that our Bukun has asked for here in Oregon that I think could be extended and, and looked at federally is both, you know, looking at those old polluting diesel engines um, and from ag equipment, how do we get those upgrades for farms to use newer, cleaner equipment? Um, and then also looking at energy efficient, affordable housing near transit or near their employment centers. And that should be looked at for all workers. You know, how do we save money on energy bills, drive less to work and lower those emissions and, and impacts? Uh, thank you so much, Meredith. And, and the district I represent in Northwest Oregon, agriculture is a really critical part uh, of our economy. Um, a lot of it is wine, uh, but also berries, hazelnuts, uh, plants, uh, 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 nursery plant nurseries, um, and they are affected by climate change, as is our outdoor recreation industry, which is, again, another part of, of our economy. So we, we do know that climate change is affecting our economy already, but as we are looking at this pandemic and the farm workers, they're already exposed oftentimes to pesticides, but uh, we need to make sure that they stay safe and healthy on the job, uh, or we're not gonna have food to eat. And, and so it's a, a really criti critical part uh, of our, our infrastructure. And, and Evelyn wanted to add something and then I'm gonna move on to the next question. Evelyn? Thank you, Representative. You know, just one final point on how to prepare our workforce that I think is crucial is really putting together specific training on coronavirus preparedness on, in, the, in the workplace. Uh, the United Brotherhood of Carpenters, our, our international organization, uh, in a couple weeks turnaround, put together a course that 100% of our staff have gone through and we're pushing out to our 29,000 members. Uh, it's a certification-based course that basically helps people uh, work more safely on the job site. And I think that really going forward, especially as we address reintegration and starting up work, we're going to need to see this kind of training on every level. Absolutely. And that's even more important in light of the inconsistent messages we get from the administration. Um, so this is going to be our last question. I can't believe we're almost out of time, but, um, and, and if everyone could respond to this, 
Um, what keeps you hopeful and energized about our fight to address the climate crisis and revitalize our economy, even in these challenging times? Where do you find hope? Who would like to start? I'm gonna, I'm gonna have Chair Castro go last. Unless you I wanna go, go for first. Dav, go ahead. Thank you, Congresswoman and, and Chair Castor again for this opportunity. Um, where I find hope is in nature itself, um, that nature is resilient and is teaching how we uh, humans can search within ourselves for that resiliency. Um, and yeah, I'll leave it at that. Perfect, who's next? I, I'm Robert. happy to share with what keeps me okay. um, inspired and hopeful, especially during these very challenging times is that folks like everyone on this panel and other folks that we all work with, uh, I think, you know, basically we are good people who care very much about Mother Earth and one another. And I feel like together we are going to come up with better solutions for a better world for all of us. That was wonderful. Thank you, Kelly. Jessica? Uh. Sorry, <laughs> um, I'll, I'll go briefly. Um, I, I think something that gives me, me hope in these times is just seeing how people are stepping up for each other in really new ways, uh, whether that's you know stories that we're hearing from our partners, workers on the front line, or just things that I'm seeing in my community, even on social media, um, the way that, that folks are stepping up um, is just really heartening and, and I think bringing us together in, in a, a way that is unique in these challenging times. Thank you, Robert. Uh, yes, Congresswoman Bonamici. Uh, I think um, you know having these conversations, these discussions like this with uh, you know folks that are on here, give me a lot of hope. But also, um, not we just can't rely on on hope. We also got to encourage others to work for it as well, um, not just rely on it, um, and really. Uh, do more to prevent these businesses from profiting uh, or, or, or eroding our, our environmental and eco and system away. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. Who's next? Uh, Representative, I, uh, what, what really gives me hope, I think, is uh, collaboration. Uh, hope is a really important baseline to spur work forward. And uh, without it, it's, uh, it's pretty tough to keep going when, when things seem too hard. Uh, we always say in our teams that uh, it may not be easy, but it is simple. And I think that even on the topics discussed today, there's many ways that there's been historical dynamics that have been really presented as adverse or automatically uh, dynamics that are at odds with each other. And there's just a tremendous amount of work that we can do together. That's wonderful. Anybody else before I turn to Chair Kester, run away in, Jana, Meredith. Uh, sure, I do, I, I do find some hope in the, the growing national focus on on climate and the urgency to act and how it's a top voting issue, the public is paying attention and the conversation is so so much farther on how do we ensure high quality jobs and center equity in that recovery and just even having this conversation to tee up before an infrastructure you know, project comes together, um, and that intention from the outset is, is different and gives me some hope that we can build a more resilient uh, Oregon coming out of this. Thank you. And Congressman Bonamici and Chair Castor, thank you so much for this conversation. I think leadership in all of its different forms is really what is uh, giving me hope and including both of you um, doing the good work that you're doing at the federal level. Um, I am blown away by youth leadership that we're seeing right now, people thinking in very new and creative ways and really looking to solve multiple problems at the same time, which I think this conversation also centered on. Um, so I think there's a lot of points of hope out there. Terrific, and, and I'm gonna let Kathy have the last word on this, but I just wanna say that um, like, like all of you, it's all of us working together and, and we see, I mean, through this, this time where people are struggling, um, we've had you know, heartfelt conversations with people who have either lost their job or lost a family member or are suffering, but they bring out the good, they, they look for the good and people go outside and they clap for the first responders and they're making masks for each other. 
Um, and I think in, in some ways um, that is, is bringing us closer to uh, a time when we can all work together uh, and, and, and improve the policies and Im Im improve uh, the, the policies that help our planet, but also help our workforce. Kathy, Chair Caster. Well, yeah. So what gives me hope in addition to all of you from Oregon, you're obviously brilliant because you sent Suzanne Bonamici to the United States Congress to solve big problems. Uh, what gives me hope right now is, is we have the scientific know-how. We have more tools at our disposal than ever. We still have America's can-do spirit, Americans, uh, American ingenuity and innovation. We can tackle this and then watching this mobilization all across the world during the COVID pandemic demonstrates that we can mobilize on a large scale basis to tackle climate as well. And we have to, we have a moral obligation to do it. And 50 years ago on Earth Day, it was people who came together. The youth movement is important, but it is, it's people of all ages. They came together at that time and created the Environmental Protection Agency, Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, the Endangered Species Act, and now we have a larger threat on our hands, COVID combined with, with climate, and I'm, but yet I'm still hopeful because of all of those reasons we can do this. And like I said, we have a moral obligation to our kids and our grandkids to get it done. Thank you so much. And thank you to again to all the panelists. And it's, re it's a real honor to have Chair Castor join us. We, we know that the coronavirus pandemic is a stark illustration of why we need to listen to the best available science, why we need to protect public health, and why we need to address the climate crisis. And I, I do hope that today's uh, discussion uh, helped demonstrate how our recovery can be an opportunity, an opportunity to create good paying jobs in our communities and to improve our nation's climate resiliency. So yes, it's a challenging time for people here um, in Northwest Oregon and across the country, but there's still reasons to remain hopeful as we recognize the 50th Earth Day today. Um, of course, it would have been nice to all be together in the same room, uh, but uh, virtually, I encourage all of you to um, to stay in touch and everyone on the the uh, the call today. Please um, stay in touch with me or my staff. You can call my office at 503-469-6010. Um, my staff is, of course, working remotely, but I think they're working around the clock. They are constantly checking uh, the messages. And please, uh, to the panelists, thank you again for all you're doing in the community. Stay safe and stay healthy. And thank you again for all you're doing. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much.